for Criminal Media's Policy, I'm Tabi Madiba, founding editor of Billionaire Tomorrow, Chris Bishop, joins me to discuss his book titled The BEE Billionaires, Redressing the Imbalances of the Past or Creating New Ones. So in the BEE Billionaires, you get up close and personal with some of the biggest names in the Black economic empowerment. The timing of this book couldn't be better seeing the situation that South Africa finds itself in. So are you trying to show both the success and failure of this policy with this book? Well, funny you should mention that because um, when uh, Penguin approached me, which was uh, year before last, I mean, you have to understand these books have a long lead time. It takes about a year and a half to put together a book. It, it was a long-term commitment. But when they approached me, they came along and said, uh, listen, we want you, because I'd written a book called The Af Africa's Billionaires, basically about the, the people on the continent who were making it. Why don't you do something along those lines, but just, you know, sort of BEE billionaires, um, uh, you know, in South Africa alone. But and I said to him, well, yeah, I'll, I'll do that. But I think it's a good idea. But it's a much richer story there. You know, where is it going? And particularly the economy at the moment, as you know, it's struggling. Um, where's the policy going? Has it actually done anything for the majority of South Africans? Is it, are the politicians approaching it right? Are people approaching it right? Are people complying with the rules? And there's a much richer story there about the uh, the shortcomings of it, and the problems with it, than actually, you know, just people making money off it, which everyone I spoke to, nearly everyone I spoke to in the book, you could argue even Silver Ramaphosa, the president, he, he also made uh, money off it. So essentially, that's the scene. Um, and uh, I think that um, there's no better time to have a look at it. Because I think tw when it started 20 odd years ago, it was a different game. You know, that the economy was cooking, the everything was okay, and, and, and companies were expanding. And now, Companies are struggling, the economy is struggling. I think there's no better time to say, well, what are we doing with this? Is it actually going somewhere or not? And talk to us more about how BEE has led to division, resentment, bitterness, and often confusion. Well, let's do it one, one at a time. I mean, bitterness, um, a lot of people uh, believe that not only, uh, I mean, even some of the people who are right in the boardroom, um, you know, who, who've got a seat on the board, who've got shares, everything that BE promises, they complain that they're excluded from a lot of the decision-making process in the companies, um, still sort of largely white-owned companies. I mean, for instance, Linda Olagonju Mabena, we call her the Queen of Green, but basically she um, she said that, you know, it's like, well, there you are, there's your place and there's your stuff right now, just leave us alone. You know, <laughs> We'll carry on running the company, you know? Um, and people aren't being developed um, I mean, she was complaining, some of the companies that she knew, uh, they're not developing young black engineers, et cetera, et cetera, not bringing people up through the system, which I think there's probably quite a grain of truth in that. Um, bitterness, I mean, some people have been used as fronts, as you know. I mean, the one thing that staggered me about the book was the fact that um, no one's actually been nailed for fronting. You know, you can get 10 years in prison for fronting for a company, uh, or you can be, um, pay, it's a heavy fine or suspension from doing business for 10 years with the, with um, government, but no one's actually been prosecuted yet. So, I mean, that's one thing. I spoke to Sondra Antuli, the, the BEE commissioner in Pretoria, and she was saying, we haven't got the people, we haven't got the resources, <laughs> we haven't got the, you know, I mean, I just think there's so many aspects. And um, division, I think... A lot of people, I think the majority of, uh, I mean, I spent a lot of time, as you know, reporting in Africa, well, nearly 30 years. I think the majority of people uh, on the ground say, well, you know, well, what's it do for us, you know? And it, probably not a lot. Um, if anything, as I said in the book, the gap between rich and poor has got even bigger than it was, um, you know, 20 years ago when this whole thing started. And I... I think the words of uh, Ipileng Makari, the uh, property BEE mogul, she said, um, I think it's an indictment upon us all. And I just, that's what I hope the book will be like a conversation starter around BEE. 
And briefly talk to us more on why you think Black economic emancipation was never going to be easy or always bring out the best in people like Gabi Mahomola. Yeah, it's never going to be easy. I mean, you look at Gabi Mahomola, there's a, good, there's a good example for you. I mean, the guy spent a lot of his youth on Robin Island uh, for what? For, he got five years for attending a public meeting. Imagine, and for activism. Imagine, like, being sentenced to, I mean, five years is for, like for malicious wounding or manslaughter, attempted murder, five years for attending. And, and he, he was on Robin Island for many years, and then he came out and and he educated himself and he had to get the States. And when he came back, he had a quite a rough ride. And he was invited into African Bank, which was one of the great standard bearers for black economic empowerment. Um long before legislation came around. And um, he suffered there. You know, he got kicked out <laughs> of a company that he was helping to create. You know, I mean, it's all in the book. Uh, and again, it, it, it's tough because you think how far people have come uh, and how far people had to come in terms of acceptance, in terms of um, confidence. I mean, African Bank's a good example. Um, you had to raise a million rand to actually register as a bank in the days when, in the eighties, when African um, bank was was launched, and it took them something like nearly ten years, I think, to raise just one million rand because no one wanted to put their money in. There was no confidence in, in a black owned bank at the time. Um, but I mean, I think the guy. I mean, that's why I, I I did a lot of the history with Mandela and also with Gabby and Sibon Corsi, um also with the Kunene brothers. I think it's all part of the story because, I mean, Patrice Motsebi once said to me, he said, there's a myth that there were no black businessmen before BEE. So there were generations of shrewd guys who who fought the system and actually made their name as business people. And and that's what I wanted to do, like give it a bit of historical context. And uh, also just to celebrate those guys because, you know, I think sometimes in the flash and dash of social media, I think a lot of these guys are forgotten. And unfortunately, um, they're still a very big part of the story. And what is the state of the world economy and how do you think international trade and investment can be improved? Well, I think everybody's suffering at the moment. I mean, across Europe, around the world, every economy is suffering at the moment. And I think every economy is having to look very hard at itself to see how it distributes its wealth and how it kind of looks after its own people. Um, I think, I still think South Africa is um, ripe for investment. I still think that uh, there's a lot of good things about South Africa. Obviously, the um, electricity shortages doesn't help. Um, and again, even to an extent, as I said in the, in the book, you know, a lot of people outside the country, they don't understand BEE. They don't understand why it, it's there and they don't understand why they should contribute to it, why they should perhaps give a, a slice of their business for it. Because they say, look, you know, all this South African story has nothing to do with me. <laughs> I was in America or Nigeria or whatever. And that's one of the chapters that I enjoyed the most, doing what people thought about BEE across Africa. You know, I interviewed some big names and entrepreneurs and billionaires, what they thought of it from other countries. And uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of people don't quite understand it, you know, because they say like, well, we don't understand why this this should be. And talk to us more on why Mike Murray emerged from a black empowerment deal, feeling slightly bruised after the black empowerment company beating his 20 year black empowerment plan lasted only for four years. Yeah, I mean, one of the founders of Mug and Bean. I mean, and I, again, I, I thought he was part of the story as well. I mean, I we one of my um, the people I was working with on the researchers came across him and said, um, you know, this guy's got an amazing story to tell. So we got on to him. And again, you know, I mean, he was some late middle aged white guy. And the best thing about it I like was, you know, he was there consulting with a guy called Gibson Tula who was quite a well-known business type, as you know, he was one of the men behind the Hao train in Hao Ting. And they, they advised each other, and he tried, like, empowerment schemes before they were mandatory, if you like. He uh, got into bed with the Tebe Investments, which 
It was run then back then by members of the, the ruling party to get into the investment world. And ultimately, um, it's just a fascinating little story, you know, I mean, how it kind of worked and they got on and, and then it didn't work. And in the end, it kind of broke up. Um, and I just thought it was a nice little story because his perspective on, you know, where it was then and how it is now, I, I thought was vital. And uh, I think that's one of the great things in the book that I liked was the fact that we had a lot of, I mean, I got people who were on both sides of the table and the mining charter talks 20 odd years ago. I mean, all those people have all moved on, and but we got them back to say what they thought at the time on both sides of the table. And I thought that um, it was fascinating because that hindsight and looking back at what happened and assessing it now and analysing it with the benefit of hindsight, I thought was was a really um, fascinating insight. And I think sometimes um, that history, you know, the old thing that, you know, you don't know where you're going unless you know where you come from. And briefly tell us how Sandile Zungo has been highly influential over BEE policy in government structures. Yeah, well, he is. He's a very influential voice. Um, I mean, one thing about Sandy Lizungu that I liked, and one of the reasons why we got him on, because, I mean, he's like the, the sort of, um, if you like, the big standard bearer for BEE in the country. He's come from virtually nothing in his life. He didn't have an easy ride to get what, where he's got. Uh, one thing I liked about his story was that, um, you know, a lot of the guys say, oh, well, you look at us and say, oh, they're an empowerment business. And so, OK, so they must have been handed all this wealth and handed all this power. But it's actually not the case. I mean, if you look at him and Seppel McLaughlin from Arena, they're like guys who actually suffered and been through the mill in business <laughs> and then uh, made, uh, you know, made money out of the uh, policy. But ultimately, I mean, Sandy Lizungu, I think he's quite an interesting guy. I mean, I think I like his perspective on it. And the fact that he was a member of the Black Business Council, and he was also still an advisor to the government. I thought he was a, a good guy to talk to because, um, you know, he's up there with policy. I mean, he's the one who's going to be advising people on exactly what to do. Uh, I, and I just think it's a great rags to riches story. You know, I mean, that, to me, that's the, the thing that's compelling about all of these stories. What is it? Um, I always remember a, a very senior politician, I won't say who, saying to me years ago, he said, Chris, if we had money, there would be no be. <laughs> no one would need it. If we had capital in the first place, there wouldn't be anything like that. But I mean, I think it's going to take a very long time to um, f for that to, to come about. But, it, but it's going to take generations. I mean, you look at it, the poor classes in the world, in Europe in particular, even, you know, it, it took people like hundreds of years to actually make it out of the, the class they were born into. And um, I think it's going to be the same with BEE. Also, one of the things in the book, actually, which I found quite interesting, one of the big um, big shots I interviewed, he said, well, maybe it's time for the equity side of BEE to be put aside. But he still feels that the... Um, the actual empowerment in terms of employing um, black managers and professionals should be carrying on, you know, because he thinks that it's still a long way to go um, before um, people actually, you know, can say, well, actually, it's been a major change. Hopefully, I'm hoping this book's going to create a few conversations, a few arguments, you know. I mean, you're always on a hiding to nothing writing a book like this. I've really felt strongly. I was put my arm in the fire when I, I decided, you know, accepted... Uh, the um, job of writing it. But I mean, I, I, you know, it was a fascinating year writing it. And I, and I think it's, it's important. I mean, it's a piece of journalism, you know, I mean, it's, it's not like, um, you know, it's uh, some sort of spiritual book. But I mean, what I'm saying is, is that it's a piece of journalism. And I hope people can pick it up, learn from it, think about it, read it, act on it. I'm hoping that people will get a lot out of it. And why does Mte Tonyati not like the suggestion that his success can be attributed to the so-called politically correct black empowerment appointment? Well, this is what I'm saying, Mte Tonyati. I mean, there's a case in point. I mean, you look you look at him. Um, I, mean, when he, <laughs> I mean, when he started with, um, it was Afrox, I think, one of the old established sort of white companies in South Africa in the 80s, I mean, they had to have a fight to get him 
appointed as a junior engineer. And when he got there, um, as he says in the book, you know, he no one really wanted to talk to him. Uh, you know, he was felt like he was ostracized and he had to work twice as hard to prove himself and to prove the man who argued for his instatement to actually, um, they had to fight to actually um, justify his decision as well. So it wasn't easy at all. But ultimately, um, again, I, I just think sometimes, I mean, you look at someone like Mteto Nyati. I mean, he's been through the mill. He's um, He got himself educated. He trained. He's got experience. He's moved up the ladder. And he's probably one of the shrewdest um, managers in South Africa, you know, senior and senior managers. And I, if I was him, I'd be angry and fed up. People say, oh, you've only got what you are because you're black. And and they've, you know, I mean, in many cases, it's nonsense. And I think people like him and Sandy Lizungu, for that matter, and Tepo Matlaoli, they're all people who've actually made their mark and worked hard to get there and been through the mill. I mean, Tepo, I mean, he used to run a, uh, one of those um, shake, shake factories in Mpumalanga, you know, <laughs> or a traditional beer. You know, uh, that was one of the first jobs he ever did. I mean, imagine the amount of nonsense you would get doing something like that. And then he had a furniture shop in Randburg and it collapsed just because of the interest rate. Nothing he'd done wrong. The interest rate, um, you know, was was high at the time. It was about 16%, I think. And he couldn't make his repayment. So the bank foreclosed on him and kicked him out in the street, basically. So they've all been through something. And um, that, that's what I say makes it fascinating in the fact that um, it's try, try to give two sides of the story, you know, the, the frustration, the failures of the system, but also on the other side, how people actually have fought their way through. Yeah, I mean, I can understand the frustration of some of the people I spoke to about um, about their careers and stuff. And it must be annoying at the end of like 40 years of graft. Someone says, oh, well, you know, you've only got what you did because, I mean, come on. And lastly, Chris, do you think that BEE should be phased out? I think the government should review it now more than ever. I think they should have a severe look at actually how it's done, how the regulations are being enforced, if you like. For instance, um, there's a lawyer I interviewed who specialises in BEE called Karen Leclerc, and she's been doing this for years and years. And uh, she had said two things to me which stuck with me. One, she said, actually, in many ways, it's a brilliant system. Because basically what you're doing, you're changing the ownership of something, which in any country in the world will be a traumatic thing, you know, where suddenly you're getting people taking something from somebody and sort of um, transferring it to somebody else. That would be a really difficult one to do, but it kind of works quietly in South Africa. You know, it's slowly, 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 but it's working quietly. That's one thing. But the second thing we talked about, because it's something that I think is one of the major planks of the book is um that how do you get it to the people and she was saying how difficult it is you know these broad-based schemes where communities are brought into uh the deals and everyone's supposed to get a bit i mean she says fraught you know because people suddenly think oh well it's okay we don't have to work anymore we're going to get um, cash from the company that's bringing us into this deal and it's not quite that easy you know i mean I mean, she was saying that there was a, a famous deal she did where one of the parts of it was setting up a maternity hospital in the community, which they needed. And some people were coming up saying, well, I don't have kids, so can I have money instead? You know, <laughs> I was saying, well, that's not quite what we're talking about. And um, I mean, and she was saying that he, she was talking to one um, community leader once and she said, well, what do you want me to do? Do you want me to get everybody here, line up and give everybody 100 rand each? And he said, well, some people, quite a lot of people would say, yeah, you know, that's what we want now. <laughs> but I mean, it's quite it's quite a difficult one. But I mean, I think that the broad based thing, as difficult as it is, I think is one of the hopes of the system. But I think the government just needs to look at it and say, look, is it working? Is it not? What's the cost of it? How is it being implemented? How is it being enforced? Who is it benefiting? Is it moving capital, um, the change of ownership of capital and skills and power as much as it should be? And if it's not, there should be changes on it. 
everyone I spoke to in the book, they said, well, not probably not in our lifetime will it be. I mean, one of the politicians I quoted was, uh, he said, oh, you know, there was no sunset clause for apartheid, so why should there be one for BEE? Maybe he's got a point, I don't know. But uh, essentially, uh, it'd be very difficult, I think, in the current political climate just to say, well, it's not going to happen anymore. And the thing, the only thing that would worry me is South Africa, if it doesn't happen and other political groups get in, they might sort of be something even more radical. And again, one of the things about BE I noticed was it's, it's sort of there in the distance, it's carrying on, it's doing something, but no one gives it that much uh, care because it kind of looks after itself. But I think that the time has come for the government to sit down and say, OK, what are we doing this? Where are we going to go? Here's a 10 year plan. Let's go for it now. That was Chris Bishop speaking to Criminal Media's Polity about the BEE billionaires.